Hi, welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Would you mind introducing yourself for us, please? Sure, certainly. Uh, my name is Yu Xun. Uh, I'm a professor in the computer science and engineering department at the University of South Florida. Um, in 2009, I started a, a lab called the Robot, a Robot Perception and Action Lab. Uh, and uh, we have been working on uh, several robotics uh, research problems since then, uh, mainly related to uh, robot perception and action, but stated on the title of the lab. Uh, so recently, uh, we uh, have a mainly working on um, uh, domestic robotics and uh, try to really uh, focusing on cooking problems uh, in a home kitchen. Um, so uh, to me, essentially, um, a, a robot, if a robot can cook uh, in a home kitchen, and uh, we think um, uh, they will be able to do all daily living tasks because, you know, cooking in a home kitchen uh, is, is probably the most complicated uh, domestic job. Is that where you see robotics really making a large impact in the near future is in the domestic application? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think, uh, so first, from my point of view, I think uh, if a robot um, have to grow, um, if a robot can grow, and we have to have a lot of uh, commercialization um, capability in the future, right? So uh, someone has to uh, put a lot of investments into this technology. And they certainly want to see uh, revenue uh, from this technology. Um, I think everybody pretty much uh, can see uh, if we can get a robot, like a service robot uh, in everyone's home, uh, that kind of revenue would certainly be able to drive um, uh, the whole uh, robotics research forward. Yeah, definitely. And talking of driving robotics forwards, uh, you, you've worked with robotic competitions and you have a robotic competition that you help run, right? Yes, I do. Um, I work uh, with um, a few researchers uh, in the field and uh, uh, been starting, uh, started this competition in 2016. It's called the Robotics Grasping and Manipul Manipulation Competitions. And uh, so this year, um, this is the fifth time we're going to run this, and we're going to run this at uh, ECRA and at IRAS. Cool. What motivated you to start this competition? Well, it's a pretty interesting story at the very beginning. Um, I was tapping into co-chair uh, their competition committee uh, with two of my friends and uh, in 2016 for IRAS. Uh, at that time, uh, we uh, tried to so solicit people who propose competitions. Um, at that time, no, not a lot of people want to organize. Um, so I've been asked to see, okay, is it possible um, to come up with some kind of competition? Um, so I, at that time, uh, I thought about, you know, there's a lot of research going on for robotics, grasping and the manipulation. And I also do research in that field. And, um, and also at that time, uh, industry is a little bit uh, tempted to, to apply robots to their applications, but they are just not sure. So I, I found that was a good time to really connect the both, uh, the academia and the industry on one side, so uh, what we can do, right? Over the years, so what do we have developed? Uh, what what are mature? And uh, and also set the expectation um, strict, right? So there's a lot of um, very fancy demo videos on YouTube and the claim robots can do everything. And um, then, you know, uh, people in industry seeing that really have uh, a wrong, um, kind of expectation. So uh, competition, I think, serve uh, uh, for both, right? For industry people to uh, get to know what we do, what is mature, and also uh, what to expect. For academia, um, people really first demonstrate what they can do. Um, second, uh, they basically use this as a, 
uh, as a way to communicate with industry, and also at the same time getting some feedback from the industry uh, to really see uh, what kind of problem they are interested in. Hmm. Interesting. Is that something you've seen in the last, you said that it's been going for five years. Uh, has there been sort of that back and forth with industry and, and academia? Yeah, sure. Certainly. Uh, we were really uh, fortunate to get a lot of sponsors at the very beginning. So over the years, every year we have uh, some support from the industry. Uh, usually there are multiple companies uh, either provide prize money or they even provide um, uh, travel support. Um, so we, we did get a lot of uh, support from industry. Um, and uh, we also seen a lot of teams um, convert their technology and commercialize their technology. And also they uh, become a startup, right? So I think we have uh, at least two teams I know, two or three, I think maybe three teams. Um, after the competition, they uh, formed uh, a startup and they basically has been quite successful. And also, I also have seen uh, a, a small startup um, participated in 2016 and they got picked up for more uh, venture capital uh, investment and uh, they grow very fast from there. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do see a lot of progress. Wow, that's great. I'm sure it, it's something that can bring together people from a lot of different backgrounds and, and, and you know industry and academia and that seems awesome. Uh, what contributions have you seen from the the competition, or, or what what value do you see that the competitions bring to you personally, and maybe uh, more from an academia side? Yeah, from academia side, I think uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, we each of us uh, will work on uh, our own things, right? So um, uh, we we attend conferences, we kind of know what other people are doing, uh, but we really don't um, have a, a, a lot of ideas of how and when this can be commercialized or, or what are the industry need, really need. Uh, so for me, um, organize, when I organized this, I basically uh, started to solicitate uh, research problems from the research industry. So before uh, our first competition, I sent out the emails to the robotics mailing list and asked people to uh, really um, send us the problems they think are interesting and important and need to be solved. And uh, we got a lot of replies. And uh, uh, from that, we come up with about uh, 30 problems. Uh, I think it's exact 30, uh, 36 problems. Um, and we formulate them and, uh, you know, convert this into task uh, pools, essentially. Uh, we use that task pool for uh, a few years. Um, and also, at the same time, I uh, reach out to um, some companies and uh, companies, including manufacturing companies and uh, logistic companies and uh, many other companies. And I, I went to their facility and talked to them. Uh, for example, I talked with um, uh, manufacturing uh, directors um, at Samsung. Um, they working with the small electronics and they try to make them and they, they have a lot of uh, industry problems and a lot of people were not aware of, such as putting cables and uh, uh, inserting, uh, handling flexible cables, uh, those kind of things. Uh, so we incorporate them um, into uh, our competition tasks. And uh, um, yeah, with that experience, I think uh, I learned a lot. And they really get a better picture uh, what the field looks like, uh, what are mature, and what are still uh, at its infancy. It seems like a great um, opportunity to learn as well, to to find a, a find a competition to sort of learn and, and try to reach for something. Do you see that the people that are competing in these competitions are the same set of people, or do you have new people coming in and, and um, um, sort of entering the field through a competition, I guess. Right. Uh, we do. We do say both. We see uh, several teams and basically continue uh, in the competition year over year, and we, we can see um, how they grow. Right. So at the very beginning, they can do uh, little 
and uh, um, uh, their stance in the in the competition uh, at the very beginning and not as good. And then over the years, the uh, continue improve their technology and uh, we can see their performance has uh, improved dramatically uh, every year we also see new teams and um, you know uh, teams coming in and uh, uh, so first they the the uh, kind of uh, at a certain stage right so yeah. at a certain stage they are the people they are ready to show off what they can do um, so um, yeah so we, we always have a new people uh, to reach that stage and uh, then they want to participate. Do you have any recommendations for people that want to get started in competitions, either, I guess, starting a competition or joining uh, an existing competition and working on it? Yeah, so for participating in our pump competition, uh, I think uh, there's many different ways. Um, first, we have uh, three different tracks uh, this year. And usually every year we have a uh, different tracks. Uh, this year, uh, we have this cloud um, kind of uh, uh, track, and it's uh, it's called the OCR uh, Talk. Um, it's uh, it's uh, basically we provide a robotic platform for everyone on cloud, um, so people can um, program and uh, create their solutions and submit. And uh, we have a people basically can run uh, the submission on a standardized platform. So that's lower the barrier, right? So you don't even need to have a robotic system to participate. Um, and we also, in, in that track, we also first provide simulator so you can simulate and then we, can, we provided the real robot uh, system you can upload or we can run that for you. Um, then um, on the other side, if you have a robotic system, and uh, then you can decide uh, which uh, direction is your passion, right? So we have uh, two tracks, uh, one on service uh, robotics, another is on manufacturing. So if you're interested in uh, domestic service like, uh, so you can participate in that. And if you're interested in manufacturing problems, and uh, we do have that track and uh, Joe, uh, Falco take the lead on that side, and from uh, he is from NIST. Um, he uh, built uh, this nice uh, task board, and we send everyone the task board for free, and uh, then they can try those uh, task board at uh, their lab. And uh, um, you know, if they feel they can do very well, then they can move forward. Yeah. Why robotic grasping and manipulation? Why that competition? Um, specifically, and you've kind of touched on this, right? So grasping and manipulation is uh, is very old problem, uh, right? So you can you can understand it's uh, it's a fundamental problem at the very beginning of robotics. People want to do something, right? So if you want to do something, you have to um, you have to touch something. You have to change the environment, right? If you want to change the environment, you have to touch it. You have to use hand and arm. Uh, those kind of thing, and uh, so that's why robotics uh, grasping and the manipulation is very important. It's a fundamental problem. Um, it needs to be solved. To me, that's the reason I get into uh, this direction because I think if robotics want to go anywhere, uh, the grasping and the manipulation um, need to be solved. Have you always seen yourself working in this area? Uh, even more generally, you know, have you always seen yourself? going into robotics and computer science and, or STEM or, or what's your what's your history kind of? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, I do have a quite diverse background. Um, so um, I was doing my uh, bachelor's uh, degree. Um, I, I mainly, uh, I majored in uh, automation, uh, particularly in the direction of uh, control theory. Uh, I also have a minor uh, in mathematics. Um, so during my uh, uh, bachelor's degree program, and uh, I learned a lot of um, control theories, obviously, and um, uh, mathematics. Um, also, uh, uh, electric circuit designs and uh, also sensor designs. Uh, mechatronics, uh, mechanical designs, and 
Uh, also, even you know, force analysis for building the structures. And obviously, at that time, um, you know, for controls, we have to learn computers. So I learned a lot of uh, architecture uh, programs, and even I learned AI at that time. Um, then I uh, went to Japan, and uh, I got my bachelor's and master's degrees uh, in China. Then I went, I went to Japan and become a software engineer and uh, started to uh, do uh, web application uh, development for uh, for phones. At that time, I think it was uh, the infancy of smartphones. Uh, they don't really have a smartphones. They only have a very tiny screen, but they want to use the phone to um, get access to internet and uh, put, uh, you know access to some of the internet applications. Um, then I... Uh, uh, got into uh, University of Utah, beca- uh, started my uh, PhD program um, study and uh, in the computer science uh, department at the School of Computing. Uh, uh, and I worked with uh, John Hallebach and started to learn robotics. I, I think my diverse background helped me uh, in robotics because, uh, you know, when we deal with uh, robots, we how to deal with robots as a whole, and uh, there are just so many different components um, of a robot, right? So, and anything can go wrong. So, if you really not want to deal with uh, electronics, or you, you not want to deal with AI, you not want to deal with programming, it's not going to go very well because any part of this system can go wrong um, if you don't really know what's happening. Uh, is going to take a lot of time uh, to to really get something working. Robotics is very interdisciplinary, and you really have to think about all of it. Um, did you do any competitions while you were a PhD student, or or? Yeah, yeah, that's a very um, good insight. Um, in two thousand seven, uh, there was a DAPA. Uh, urban challenge. Mm. Uh, so I participated in there uh, um, at that time. Uh, I was uh, at my last year of uh, at my last year of my PhD program, um, and uh, I pretty much in charge. Uh, I work with a lot of people, right? So we have a big team. I think we have about ten people, and at that time, I think uh, Tom Henderson and uh, Mark. Uh, minor. Uh, they, they were the team leaders, and we got a group of, uh, of people from mechanical engineering, computer science, uh, participated in this. And I was uh, mainly working on intersection, uh, vehicle detections, and uh, negotiating between vehicles, you know, how to follow the rules, the traffic rules of intersection. Mm. Um, yeah, that was quite impressive. I mean, I'm talking about the, the organization of that challenge. Um, I can also see uh, from that challenge, the whole aut- autonomous vehicle uh, field has yeah. uh, exploded, right? So uh, with that common goal, uh, everybody bought that common goal and the, the research community um, really, really spent a lot of effort to that. Uh, to that, uh, you know, to, to to try to fulfill that kind of vision. Is that how you see the robotic grasping competitions and stuff like that playing out, where that really helps then, you know, bring in this domestic robot that's in your house, helping you with all these kinds of tasks and stuff? Um, do you think, like, competitions are necessary to kind of spur on that growth? Yeah, so... I think after that, there are many different competitions. And even DAPA has another competition involves with some components of uh, manipulation. Um, uh, but they obviously, they, they focus a lot of walking. Uh, but also uh, in the robotics community, there are uh, many different competitions. A lot of them has to do with uh, domestic service. Uh, every year you, have, you can see uh, some number of competitions. Um, so what we want to do is uh, we want to do something um, consistent, right? So we want to keep monitoring the progress. Uh, we want to really understand uh, what what are uh, kind of uh, uh, what are the research problems, what are not, what has been solved, 
And um, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, this I hope this serve as a, as a bridge uh, between the academia and the industry. And uh, um, I always think uh, all the technology we de- develop it in academia should be used in industry, right? We should find, um, find a place to be used. And um, yeah, so that's, that's probably the driven force of uh, me to try to try to, you know, organize this kind of events, try to really bring what we can do to industry and to bring what the, the research problem uh, in industry to academia. And also, yeah. Rob, and also, you know, you, you asked me about whether, you know, uh, DAPA challenge will be the region. Um, to that, I think it's very difficult for us to uh, really uh, get to that scale, right? So DAPA has uh, probably unlimited budget. Uh, they have a billion dollars to spend. Yeah. Uh, at each year, we have some support from the industry, but we uh, never will be able to get in, um, you know, a significant amount, right? We certainly want to, uh, if it's possible, to, to form some kind of alliance uh, with key players in industry um, uh, who will benefit from the growth of robotics grasping and manipulation. Um, they, if they want to contribute, and I think this is a good place to contribute. And uh, so we can certainly organize this kind of thing, getting people together and uh, yeah, to make the event uh, uh, better and more inclusive. Yeah. In your past, you've worked on medical applications. Is there any overlap between the competition and any sort of uh, medical or hospital application? Well, uh, not really at this time. Um, So previously, I'm mainly working um, on uh, virtual reality uh, for uh, medical applications. Um, So at that very time, I was mainly trying to uh, help the surgeons to see better. Mm. Um, so uh, the surgeons using endoscope um, for minimum, minimally invasive surgery. And uh, when, they, when they use that, um, they have to look at uh, overhead monitor. And they move the endoscope. Uh, the endoscope can look from any directions and with any kind of orientation. So the picture at the overhead monitor is really kind of display of a certain angle you don't really know, right? So you really have this terrible hand-eye correlation mm-hmm. and it's make training of surgeons very difficult. Um, so we want to solve that kind of problem. So we basically develop a kind of um, a transparency display and uh, um, convert the image from the endoscope uh, cameras um, uh, into a uh, morphed image and it can be projected on the abdomen to generate a transparent effect, you know, to, to give the natural hand-eye correlation back. Yeah, that's awesome to really help support the surgeons doing their work. Do you right. think we're anywhere close to having a robotic surgeon, um, to, uh, a robot actually doing the physical grasping and manipulation that's required for surgery? So first, I, I think certainly uh, in the future, um, I can see a lot of uh, uh, research progress in many different labs in academia, doing a lot of uh, surgical robotics research. And also the in, in industry, uh, intuitive surgery is the lead uh, in the industry, the, uh, making a lot of progress with their Da Vinci system. And uh, each year they, they come up with some kind of uh, uh, automated procedures, and uh, it's always uh, interesting to see um, uh, how much progress they, they, they are making. Uh, usually, very very impressive. Yeah. So for me, uh, I mainly in the last few years mainly focusing on uh, robotics cooking, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, because as I said, you know, in the domestic environment, cooking is probably the most challenging task. It involves so many different things. And uh, 
um, you know, a person, you can think about when you do cooking, uh, you have to allocate, recognize objects, allocate them, and really figure out how to pick them up, uh, holding them, holding tools. And you also have to do all kinds of different manipulations, right? So uh, cutting, pouring, uh, very diverse environment, very diverse uh, uh, number of uh, objects. They have a different kind of shapes and tools, right? So got so many tools, so many utensils in the kitchen and, uh, um, and also, um, you know, manipulations, right? So you have to handle them properly. Yeah, so it's very challenging. So for me, um, we really working on three different aspects of this. Uh, the first thing we work on is uh, knowledge representation and retrieval. So we try to really figure out how to represent this compl complicated, complex information when you really do the uh, do the cooking, right? So for us, we understand the recipes. Uh, we even watch a YouTube instructional video. We understand how to do the cooking and how we can work that information to robot, right? So how robot will be able to gain cooking knowledge. So that's the, uh, the one of the things we, we work on. The second thing we work on is uh, multi-object grasping. So not only, um, you know, we, we grasp one object at a time, right? So we, we do that, but a lot of times um, uh, at our home kitchen, for example, we want to pick up strawberries from a box. Um, you know, we don't pick one by one. We pick multiple strawberries from the box at one time and eggs the same. We pick two or three at the same time. And it's not only in home kitchen, also in industry like logistics. You, you see people uh, in logistic, uh, they pick a couple apples from one bean and put into another bean. You don't really see, you know, a worker, a human worker pick apple one by one, if, you know, if the desired number is, for example, five, right? So they usually pick two and three, and then you get five. Um, and also in manufacturing, right? So we, we pick up multiple screws at the same time and put them one by one. Um, so that's one of the reason robotics is not as efficient as a human yet, because uh, when we do, when people do picking, right? We, we do, we pick multiple at the same time. We, when robot doing the pick, picking at this time, even the best robots, they still can only do pick one by one. And with that is by default is like, uh, you know, two or three times less efficient uh, than are, their are person. Um, so that's the, that's one of the things um, I work on. Um, and I call this um, cookie jar problem. Mm. Uh, because, you know, when you have a kid and you, <laughs> you say, okay, you can go to the cookie jar, pick some cookies. You don't really see a kid just go in and pick one cookie. Right, so you you have a kid basically go goes in, pick a couple of cookies out, and but if you have a robot, say okay, robot, you can go to pick a cookie. The robot can just pick one cookie at a time. If there is a competition, obviously the robot will not win, and the a kid will, will certainly win that one. Right, so uh, that is a, a interesting direction we currently working on. And uh, another direction we're working on is uh, motion generation. And we're particularly working on pouring uh, because pouring is the most frequent uh, manipulation uh, motion in cooking. And uh, pouring not only pour liquid, like uh, water, oil, honey, uh, syrup, those kind of uh, liquid, but also, you know, rice and beans, flour, uh, those kind of thing. And also even large chunks, right? You cut something, you put into a bowl and you don't want to pour the whole thing into uh, into uh, a pan. You pour, want to pour a portion of that. Uh, how would you control? How would you do the, do the pouring? Um, so we've been working on that. Um, so we had a finished uh, pouring liquid. We do fairly well uh, on precise uh, pouring liquid precisely. And now we mainly focusing on pouring uh, big chunks of objects precisely. Hmm. Interesting. 
And, and you mentioned that pouring precisely. I could imagine a lot of challenges in in doing in tackling these problems. What do you see as the the largest problems right now? Yeah, there are many different challenges, and uh, one of the things is. Uh, for some reason, we as humans understand the dynamics very well. We kind of can predict what's going to happen. So we basically compensate our emotions um, in terms of how everything going to fall or how many going to fall. We have a pretty accurate prediction. We basically recover the, the pouring motion before everything, um, you, you, everything basically poured out. And uh, it is kind of irreversible right so if you pour more than you need and uh, for some of the cases it, you will be in trouble right so but you can't by just control the the pouring speed to have something falling back to the pouring cup so it is more of uh, irre- irreversible uh, kind of motion so we have to do pretty good job on predicting what what is going to happen the second challenge uh, we also deal with is generalization because we don't want to, um, you know, learn something that's only working for this kind of container or this kind of object. Uh, we want to really learn a skill, a pouring skill for a robot that can basically use any containers and pour anything. Um, yeah, so we, we basically uh, try to use practice uh, to to solve this kind of problem because when we uh, do poor unknown things, we we kind of practice a little bit, and then after a couple of times of practice, we will be able to do fairly well. So we try to use practice to uh, really modify or uh, or transfer our models to this new situation uh, without um, a lot of failures, right? So we want to make sure the practice is also uh, doesn't really have failures, but really uh, not necessarily have the best performance, but at least not have failures. You mentioned that out of this, a couple of your students have started uh, companies or, or have gone into industry. And then I also noticed looking into your background, you have multiple patents. Could you kind of talk about how, um, how sort of the balance between papers and patents and how patents maybe as a grad student, you know, when to patent or why to patent or even how to patent your work that you're working on. Because like if you're working on these competitions that are related to industry and industry is looking to use it, um, sort of how does patent play a role in there? Right. So I think a patent is quite important if you want to uh, start thinking about uh, uh, after you graduate, uh, you may want to uh, form a startup, for example, and um, uh, during your um, academic year and, uh, and during your research, you probably want to think about uh, building your own IP uh, portfolio, right? So um, that gives you a solid foundation uh, when you um, start to do uh, this uh, entrepreneurship, try, try, to, try to form a startup. Uh, so I think from that point of view, um, it's quite, infor- uh, quite important for everyone. Uh, who want to go to a startup route. Um, in terms of starting, um, uh, when to uh, apply for a patent, I think at the time you have a technology, it works and you know it is innovative. And that's at the time you should um, think about a patent. And usually the university has a patent and licensing office. So you should talk with uh, those patent and the licensing office people and they can help you to apply. And they usually um, hire uh, IP attorneys and they will help you to uh, write it up and uh, draft the the claims and everything. Um, Yeah, then they will apply, yeah. Nice, yeah. We're getting close to time here, but I, I like to finish with this. So what are you most excited about moving forward with your research, with anything? What are you most excited about? So I'm pretty excited about uh, robotics in general. I think uh, this is uh, the right time uh, for robotics and in terms of uh, making progress in research and also um, apply the research outcomes into industry and really getting the technology uh, used. Right. So uh, before uh, robotics are seen as uh, kind of uh, 
demos are fun and people get inspired to get into the engineering. Um, we see a lot of the large companies have tried and get into robotics field, and uh, but we don't see a lot of follow up. Um, but now I think we really reach to that kind of maturity and a lot of technology, I think. Um, has found a way of industry like a logistic industry. And I believe in very short period of time, a lot of uh, uh, technology developed for service robotics, domestic robotics will be uh, picked up by industry, will be used uh, to develop a real uh, robotic system that can be really used uh, at our home and to help us to do our domestic works. Awesome. Well, that was great. I loved hearing your insight on everything and your experiences. And thank you for taking the time to do this chat. Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. That's my pleasure. Thank you.